today, we reaffirm today, that you are the tower of strength that we need each and every day. You, Lord, are the treasure that is above every other treasure we could ever seek or possess. You, Lord, are my all in all. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity in the midst of pandemic to sit down and be reminded again of your sovereignty and your control. We are in the hands of Almighty God, and that's a good thing to know. We could be no more secure and no more protected than that. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your answered prayer in these days, for your presence with us, and the promise of your continuing presence and the assurance of your power at work. We love you and we thank you, Heavenly Father. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to say thank you again to uh, Olivia and to Laura and Lori and Heather for reminding us of who Jesus is by singing Dennis Jernigan's song for us today to start our recording. I really appreciate that little bit of music that uh, has been injected into each one of our recordings uh, in our services lately. You ladies have done a wonderful job with that, and we want to say thank you. Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening or good night or whatever it is for you, Chalmers Community Church family and friends. Pastor Bruce Jones here again with you on this Sunday, April the 25th, 2021. We're in the middle of the third wave of the COVID pandemic here in Ontario, and in the last couple of weeks, we've uh, seen a return for all of Ontario to the kind of lockdown that we haven't seen since this time last April. I was thinking not long ago, it was about a year ago right now, I was still holding out hope that... Uh, Ruth and I would be able to take a trip down to Florida in October. That was last October, obviously, uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, in fact, I'm beginning to wonder, even though it's, it's six months away, whether this October may even be able to happen. Hopefully, we'll be able to, to do some travel before too many more months go by. Uh, although right now the international border remains closed to all except the most, uh, most essential of travel, I guess, right? Um, and uh, even our provincial borders are zipped up a little bit more than they've been before between us and Manitoba on the west and us and Quebec on, on, on the east. And I think most of us are still kind of cautiously optimistic, yet we've had our minds seriously opened up to the realities of pandemic living yet again lately. I read somewhere last week that Ontario is now one of the highest spreading COVID hotspots on the planet. 
not our part of Ontario, thankfully, but Ontario, Ontario at large. And that obviously is not a distinction that we as a province should be proud of. So all of that said, it looks as if our services are going to remain online for quite some time yet. Probably the earliest chance of regathering in person will be the end of May, but even that I think is a little bit optimistic. Even the exact date of regathering, that's going to depend upon the progression of the virus and the uh, variants of the virus. It'll, it'll depend upon the vaccine rollout, what the capacity levels will be for religious services and even for outdoor gatherings. Once we are again able to meet again, and it'll slowly be returning to pre-pandemic life. So the timing on that uh, is totally unclear, but we'll try to keep tabs on that and uh, get together again when we can. But given all of that reality, <clears throat> one of the things that we want to look at a little bit as, as uh, elders and as, as, as staff and me as a pastor here uh, is, is anything that we can do to help increase our level of connectedness and interaction in our Sunday morning services, our online services. Um, as I'm recording this, this is Thursday morning and this evening, Thursday night, our elders will be meeting and uh, one of the things I'm going to bring up, uh, 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 talk about a little bit, is an idea. I can't really share it right now because I don't want to confuse you if we end up tinkering with the idea to make it work a little bit better, but something to sort of help increase, for those who crave it at least, a, um, uh, a, an increase of interaction and connectedness in our Sunday morning services. But I would encourage you, watch your email inbox for information about this in the coming days. And I'll probably talk about it next Sunday as well. Probably I'll be able to talk about it, hopefully, with a, a little bit more clarity next Sunday as well. Um, if you are not on our Chalmers email list, I would encourage you to do that. Certainly you can access the uh, sermons and our recordings through just straight to YouTube. But uh, if you come onto our, our Chalmers email list, you'll be able to get the sermon outlines that go with the sermon as well. Both the blank outline and the, uh, and the, the one with the, uh, with the blanks filled in so you can make sure that we know what we're doing. Plus you'll get a, 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 a direct link sent to you each Sunday morning with the link to the service. You'll also, if you uh, let us have your email address, You'll also be able to be sent our Wednesday email devotional that I send out each week. Plus, on every Monday, uh, Katie sends out uh, uh, Chalmers this week, a little e email info about what's going on in the church that week. So if you would uh, be willing to sign up for that, that would be great. You can either email Katie at info at chalmerschurch.com or myself, Bruce, at chalmerschurch.com. I think that would be just great. Well, April. We're still in April. Seems like April has been a year-long month. But April is the month where we usually see spring come alive, isn't it? And we did see that this year, even though, you know, the, the really cold weather of this last week notwithstanding, spring is springing around, uh, up all around us. But April is usually also the month when we experience the Easter holiday. And that was the case this month. Very uh, early on in the month, we had a good Easter weekend a number of weeks ago. Uh, in fact, our last in-person service was the Good Friday service on April 2nd. Then right after that Friday, the capacity limits for services went down way too low for us to be able to have in-person services. And so starting Easter Sunday the 4th, we, uh, we were online again. But we pushed ahead nonetheless with the finishing up of our Journey to Easter Bible Reading Challenge and the, the, the message series that came out of that as well. If you remember back on Easter Sunday, uh, first of our online only services again in this uh, current time anyway, we looked at the resurrection of Christ according to Mark, or at least according to the person who wrote the last half chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And we saw that the disciples received a rebuke from Christ, didn't we? They were rebuked because they were slow to believe and slow to respond the new, to the news of Christ's resurrection. They also received a commission from Jesus, and we'll talk about that word commission a little bit later today. And Jesus also gave them the motivation to then carry out his commission upon them. And then after Easter Sunday, I kind of thought that we'd maybe stretch the Easter theme to last for the rest of the month. So, our, so we're talking about the Easter month of April. I made the decision to elongate our journey a little bit so that we could dive into what each of the other gospel writers said about the resurrection of Christ, or at least some of what each of them said about the resurrection of Christ as well. So for the rest of April, we've called it, yes, the journey to Easter, but the journey continues. That's a good way to look at it because the journey's never really over. Uh, our journey to Easter continues in for, on for the rest of our lives. 
So anyway, the week after Easter, that would be April the 11th, we looked at the resurrection according to, the, to Luke. And especially, the, in particular, the story of the disciples, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, they were deflated, and no doubt they were going back to their old way of life, right? With their proverbial tail between their legs. Uh, and these two guys, they met Jesus along the way. All of a sudden, Jesus appeared to them, and, and, and they did not recognize him uh, immediately. But their hearts began burning with recognition because Christ gave them a rebuke and a reprimand, just like he did with the other disciples. Then he restated the Messiah's true mission to them. He took time to open up the Old Testament scriptures to point out how Jesus had perfectly fulfilled Old Testament prophecy about the Savior who was to come. Just opened their eyes to that. And then Jesus, after they, they encouraged Jesus to come into their home and, 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 and eat with them, that night Jesus simply repeated the act of saying grace. He took bread, he looked up to heaven, he gave thanks, he broke it and he handed it out to those disciples. And just at that moment, finally it clicked in. The, the, the recognition clicked in that this was, in fact, Jesus, the risen Lord himself. And, and at that moment, he was taken from their presence. He vanished into thin air. But the guys ran back into Jerusalem, and they were with the other disciples later that night when Jesus appeared to all of them. What an interesting story and some great things we could find out and catch from that story. But then just last Sunday, that was April the 18th, our online message looked at the resurrection according to John. So Mark, Luke, and now John. And then with some words of assurance thrown in there by the Apostle Paul as well. And those words we uh, looked at that week uh, can give us peace and assurance as we serve Jesus in this world that is so weird right now. And part of what we looked at also took us to some of John's later words near the end of the New Testament, especially as he outlines... Um, for us or for any reader, how things finish well. It all ends well for the believer in Jesus Christ. The Easter future that we have to look forward to is an eternity of fulfillment and service in a literal heaven, doing the work that God has prepared us all of our lives to do. So don't ever think that your service for the Lord is done at a certain age. You can retire from a career, but you can never really retire from serving Jesus. Don't ever think that you can get too old for serving him here. Because even when we die, we are just beginning the work that Christ has prepared us to do. Even when we die, we're just beginning this relationship with him that he intends to have with us for all of eternity. So it would kind of seem fitting for us to finish off the month, the final Sunday of April, looking at the resurrection according to who? Matthew. And that's what we're going to do today. Uh, your sermon outline is right there. I encourage you to have that in front of you, although we won't be delving into that for a couple of minutes yet. But it's the re resurrection according to Matthew. I've entitled it Emmanuel, God with us to the end of time. There's probably lots of titles that we could give to this last chapter of Matthew, but I wanted to specially note that. We're going to read the last chapter of Matthew in just a moment, but just before we do, I want you to consider why I've called it Emmanuel, God with us to the end of time. Remember one of the names for the Messiah, originally written by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 7. It's a name that Matthew quotes way back in the very first chapter of his gospel, Matthew 1, 23. Emmanuel, and the meaning of Emmanuel could be spelled with an I or an E at the beginning. It means God with us. So we see Jesus claim that for his very own at the end of the book, where he says, in fact, the final words are, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God with us, proclaimed by Isaiah and, um, and, and by Matthew, at the very beginning, at, at the time of Jesus' birth, and I am with you, God with us, at the very end. God with us in the person of Christ as he walked the earth, and God with us in the person of the Holy Spirit who resides in the hearts of every believer, as promised by Jesus when he said he would never leave us alone. That is good news. That's Emmanuel from beginning to end. If you are Jesus' person, if you have simply come to him in trusting faith, you have the assurance of his presence with you and he is not going to let you go. He isn't. We're going to see in Matthew chapter 28 
some things that the ladies who went to the tomb that morning experienced, and then we're going to see some things that Jesus imparted to the disciples some 40 days later. And I'm sure that one or more of these things, there's six particular things all together, and one or more of these things, I believe, is going to resonate with each one of us as we actually read and listen for God's prompting in our hearts today. Well, I want to read the last chapter of Matthew. Actually, we're going to need to start a wee bit before that in chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 62. Please have your Bibles open to that, and we are going to read that. Starting at chapter 27, verse 62. Christ has been crucified at this point, buried by Joseph of Arimathea with the, the, um, the, the help of Nicodemus as well. Uh, buried in a borrowed tomb. And then we read something that only Matthew tells us about, starting in verse 62 of chapter 27. I, uh, I uh, typed, got it, uh, ran off for myself on this, this page because I wanted to, to, uh, to read it off this way. And so I'm just going to read it here on, on my page for you. Starting verse 62. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Now stop there for just a second. You probably have read that a bazillion times and not really understood what actually that was saying. Actually, that's Matthew's very gracious way of pointing out the fact that these chief priests and Pharisees were breaking their own law. Because the one after... Preparation day, what's preparation day? It's the day before Sabbath. Preparation day is Friday. Jesus was put to death on Friday. So what this is saying is, on the Sabbath day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Now that's important because the chief priests and the Pharisees are breaking their own Sabbath laws by working on the Sabbath, by doing what they're doing on the Sabbath, by scheming in this way on the Sabbath. They're probably not only breaking the Sabbath law of working, but they're breaking the Sabbath law of the Sabbath day's journey by walking further than what was a Sabbath day's uh, journey uh, that they were allowed to walk. So these guys were so desperate to get rid of Jesus that they were willing to break their own, uh, one of their own most sacredly held laws. Isn't that something? Anyway, verse 63. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Take some of my soldiers. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. Some commentators think that actually what he's saying is, sure, keep them in there if you can. <laughs> Almost as if he's flippantly sort of saying, yeah, if, but if he rises, he rises. Certainly that would uh, be a great vindication for Pilate because Pilate didn't think that there was anything wrong with Jesus. He thought that Jesus was an innocent man, so if Jesus rose again, that would actually look well for Pilate. But whether he was truly trusting in Christ or not, we don't know. But anyway, so verse 66 says, So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone, like a hot wax seal around the stone, so as it hardens, it's, it's uh, easy to tell whether the stone's been tampered with in any way. And they posted a guard. This is a guard of Roman soldiers. Now we get into chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Now they think the other Mary is perhaps the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. So this would be Zebedee's wife named Mary. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. Verse 2 says, there was a violent earthquake. More rather, it should read, now there had been a violent earthquake. We don't know exactly when the earthquake happened. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. In other words, the guards were so scared, they fainted dead away. I've often thought if there was any comedy, if there was any humor in the resurrection of Christ, if we were to make a movie out of it at all, this is where we'd find the comedy, right? These soldiers, great big tough, you know, Roman soldiers, all of a sudden getting so scared that they fainted dead away. So all of them are laying there on the ground. And at some point, whether that happened when Mary, whether the two Marys were there, or whether it happened before the two Marys came, anyway, when the Marys come, the guy hit the soldiers are, are laying out flat on the ground. Some people think this is actually maybe the second time Mary Magdalene had come to the tomb. That would be supported by some of the other um, some of the other recollections of Christ's resurrection, but that's that's neither here nor there at the moment. 
But uh, anyway, the uh, angel then say to the woman, and this is, this is the humor of it, the soldiers are laying there fainted dead away, and these two, these two ladies are, are, are there, and they've not fainted. Because the angel says to them, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Come see for yourselves, he says. Verse 7, Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will, they will see me. And now in verse 11 we revert back to the story that only Matthew talks about, the posting of the guard. And we see some interesting things that come out of this. Verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards who finally came back, came to again, then some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. And again, this is a sentence I've read many times and not really understood how interesting it is. So the guards, who are Roman soldiers, occupiers of the Jewish people in that place, went into the city and reported not to their own authorities, not to their own uh, officers, they reported to the chief priests, to the Jewish chief priests, everything that had happened. And the question hit me this week, why didn't they report to their own superior officers? They did not go and report to their own superior officers, I'm telling you, because they would have been executed on the spot. To admit that this happened under their noses when they were supposed to be guarding, there would have been no excuse for them. They would have been killed right away. Well, verse 12 goes on. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. Ha! Huh, bribed them. Telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Ha! Huh, this is the story you need to tell. And so what these soldiers are doing uh, are basically admitting to dereliction of duty. They are admitting to being bad soldiers. They are saying, you know, we fell down on our duty and these guys came and stole the body away. In other words, this ragtag band of fishermen were able to beat up on us, soldiers of the Roman army, while we were sleeping. Wow. <laughs> they say in verse 14, if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. How are they going to satisfy him? No doubt they're going to satisfy him with money as well. So they're willing to bribe not only the guards, but bribe the governor too. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. Probably they never wore another soldier's uniform for the rest of their lives, but the money, you know, the bribe of money is what they lived off of. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. That helps to explain this one thing that some Jewish people were hanging on to, saying, uh-uh. He was stolen away, his body was stolen away, but the disciples proved in the next decades that there was no, there, there, that, that this was something, their resurrection was something that was true. They would never have given their lives as they did for a cause that they, did, that they knew was a lie. Anyway, verse 16, we'll talk more about this some other time. Some really good stuff that we can look at with regard to, uh, to this. You know, verse 16, actually what it does is it skips to 40 days later. But actually, just before jumping into verse 16, I want to think of something. I want to stop there for a second. Stop and think about this cover-up for just a moment, okay? Think about this cover-up. These religious leaders were so desperate to get rid of Jesus that they used treachery and treason to apprehend him in, in, in Gethsemane in the first place. And then they used illegal means to carry out his trial. Remember, we looked at that on Good Friday, talking about some of the different illegal things that happened in, the, in those evening trials, like nighttime trials. They used slander and lies in their charges against him in these trials. And then they broke their own strict Sabbath laws, probably the most sacred of all of their laws, to try to keep him in the tomb. And then they used bribery of not only the soldiers, but perhaps even the governor himself, to silence the truth about the resurrection. But in all of that illegal and immoral activity, you know what? It's, they still failed. They still failed. Because the truth will always prevail. Jesus rose again. It is true. You can stake your life on it. And the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ has resulted in literally billions of people across the planet through the ages 
putting their full trusting faith in him. The truth will prevail, and Jesus is who he said he was. And he proved it by rising again from the dead. Someday we're going to look at a stu- do a study of the first chapter of Acts. Ch- Acts chapter 1, verse 3 talks about many convincing proofs that Jesus uh, uh, showed to prove that he was alive. And those many convincing proofs happen over the next 40 days before Christ's ascension. Right? Matthew skips in verse 16, back to verse 16 now. He skips to 40 days later, after Jesus had appeared many different times to the different to many of the different disciples. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks about one occasion when Jesus, uh, in those 40 days, appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. So there was one after another, after another, after another of appearances of Jesus alive again to these disciples. Now, he was not living with them every moment of every day, but was appearing to them many times. And I think it was because Jesus was preparing them for the fact that eventually... You know, 40 days, and within 40 days, he was going to ascend, and his physical presence was not going to be with them in, in, anymore, even though he was sending his Holy Spirit to live within them. And so Jesus was preparing them. So, that, so that's why he wasn't with them all the time. And that helps to explain the next couple of verses. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, verse 16 says, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now that, that verse has always kind of stuck in me a little bit. How could they doubt? I mean, even doubting Thomas has for weeks by this point said, my Lord and my God, because he saw the risen Christ. None of those disciples obviously could be doubting the, the, the resurrection of Jesus anymore. Why does, it, why does Matthew say some doubted? The easiest way to explain this, the easiest way to look at it is the simplest. Really, they saw him because they hadn't, that he wasn't with them all the time. He, they saw him from afar. And, they, and this was another of the occasions when they said, There he is! Oh, praise God, there he is! And they started worshipping him because this was just another occasion when they, when, when, when they had, had seen him since his resurrection. But some were doubting. In other words, they were saying, Is that really him over there? I'm not sure. The ones whose maybe long, uh, long vision, whatever we call that, like me, that, that's what's the weakest on me. That's why I need these glasses for seeing distance, not up close. That were, were like, I'm not sure that's him. That's where the doubt came in. But then the very next words show us how Jesus removed all doubt. The beginning of verse 18. Then Jesus came to them. Jesus walked closer to them, removing all doubt that in fact it was him. That's exactly what it's meaning when it says, but some doubted. Some weren't sure that that was actually him. But as he came closer, they realized it was. Jesus came to them, removing all doubt, as it were, and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, or help others to follow me like you do. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I never get tired of reading the old, old story of Jesus and his love. His sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sins. His resurrection from the grave, proving that he is God himself. And he has the power to defeat death and to give the gift of eternal life to every single person who would trust him. I love that story. It's my favorite. Well, I want to kind of put a bow on our journey to Easter and beyond by bringing out three, as I mentioned, three very interesting and applicable points we see in the experience of the, of the ladies Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, in verses 5 to 10. And then three very interesting and applicable points that we see from the disciples' point of view in their experience 40 days later, just before Jesus ascended back to heaven. And I'm going to try to do that relatively quickly. Six points. And I think they encompass the sum total, the full spectrum of what we need to embrace as we live as Jesus' people today. There are, uh, and, and so uh, I want you to take your outline. You can fill in the blanks as you go. Just one word for each. It's easy today. From the ladies' experience, we see some things from verses 5 to 10. And the first is this. When the ladies encountered the fact of, G- of Christ's resurrection, they were urged to believe. They were urged to believe. Look at verse 5 and 6. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Now, this is a case of something being so incredibly wonderful that it seems beyond belief, right? So the angel's purpose 
was to open their hearts to the fact that, yes, the impossible has happened. Come see for yourself. So I'm thinking, boy, talking about belief, if you are maybe one of those people who has found it hard to believe that Jesus actually defeated death in this way, that Jesus actually rose again, I think universally on the planet, there's probably not a person who's ever thought this through who would deny that Christ died. But if you're one of these people that has found it hard to believe that he rose again from the grave that helped to prove his power over death and prove that he is God, you might think, sure, he was a great teacher, he was a holy example, he was a wonderful man, but it stops there. I urge you, just like the angel does, I urge you to believe. Don't let your experience of Jesus be shortchanged like that. There is great reason to believe in him. There is great reason and many convincing proofs to embrace Jesus as more than just a good man. He is the one and only Savior of mankind. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. He is God himself. So I, like the angel, urge you to believe as well. Or if your belief has sort of faded away to something less than it was at some point, I urge you to restate and renew your belief in Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord, and the one who has control and claim over your life too. Second point that we see, when the ladies encountered Christ's resurrection, not only were they urged to believe, they were urged to then share it. They were urged by not only the angel, but by Jesus himself. Verses 7 and 8, then, quick, then go quickly and tell his disciples, the angel said, that he's risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And then skip over to verse 10. Jesus himself told them to share. He said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So when these ladies um, um, encountered the resurrected Christ, they were urged to share that truth with others. The angel urged them, and Christ himself urged them. And that makes me think, you know, when you hear the good news, when you hear good news about anything, you want to spread that good news to others, right? Uh, that's one of the things that we as followers should have on our, our priority list, spreading the good news to other people. Yet that's one of the things that most Christians are afraid to do. We're afraid for many reasons, some of them legitimate, some of them not. And certainly one of the things that I want to not only help myself in doing, but all of us do, is to become more comfortable in sharing our faith, more comfortable in talking about God and His goodness in our lives, talking about Jesus, gossiping the gospel so we can be obedient to the angels urging and to the words of Christ as well. We'll maybe talk some more about that. I have a whole series I want to do on helping us understand and share our faith. And we'll even talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So when the ladies encountered the fact of Christ's resurrection, they were urged to believe, they were urged to share, and thirdly, they were urged to rejoice. Look at verse 9. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Certainly they had begun rejoicing him, but the literal meaning of the word greetings is rejoice. And rejoice they did, right? The literal meaning of that word is rejoice. And so their joy knew no bounds. They experienced the literal living presence of Jesus Christ and that changed their lives. It infused a kind of joy into them that shone out from them not only that day but for the rest of their lives too. And we see that same thing being done to the disciples as well. Their joy and their relief and their excitement at who Christ was and the fact that he was alive was, it, was what prompted them to be his servants for the rest of their lives. So this joy at its root is a centered, calm assurance that God is in control. Yes, there can be some emotion associated with this joy, yes, but it is the centered, calm assurance that God's in control. Nothing can extinguish that kind of trusting joy. So the ladies, they were urged to believe, urged to share, urged to rejoice, and that becomes major encouragements for us, for God's people today as well. And if you add that to the things that we see the disciples going through and experiencing, you will get a good summing up of what we are left here on the planet to do. So number four, which is actually the disciples' experience, the first part of the disciples' experience, which was the culmination of the next 40 days, 40 days later, these last verses of Matthew wrap up some of, the, of, of Jesus' last words to his followers before he left to go back to his father before he ascended back into heaven. And we call these words the Great Commission. Uh, but the Great Commission actually includes three things. And the thing that we think of as the commission itself is only one of those three things. 
verses 18 through 20, the, 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 and, and I'm, I'm going to outline those three things right now. And the first is this. In the last moments before Christ's ascension, he assured his disciples of his power. You could also write in that blank, and his authority. He, urged, he, he uh, assured his disciples of his power and his authority. Look at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is a huge statement. I shared about this on Wednesday in the, in the weekly email devotional, but what a great e realization that is. Unbelievable thing that is. Jesus is the supreme and only real authority in heaven and on earth. Nothing happens on this planet not even COVID, not even the difficult and painful things that you have experienced and endured, not even the death of loved ones, not even divorces and difficulties in our relationships uh, with other people, not even injustices and the results of sinful actions of other people and of ourselves. Nothing happens without being filtered first through the grid of the love of our Savior Jesus Christ and through the perfection of His will. Nothing happens without His knowledge and, 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 and His working it through to accomplish His purposes. Now, we don't understand His purposes. Do I understand why COVID happened? Do I understand why literally the whole world has been enveloped with this story over the last year to year and a half? No, I don't. Do I understand why any painful things happen? Do I understand why divorces and difficulties and injustices happen? No, I don't understand. Nor do I need to. You see, figuring it out doesn't ultimately help me deal with it. Assigning blame doesn't ultimately help me to deal with it. But what I do need, and what you need too, is the rock-solid assurance that my Savior is in control. He is in control. Whether our emotions uh, at times will, will allow us to believe it or not, He is in control. Christ is the supreme authority and power. He reassured his disciples of this just before he said the last two things. See, in the last moments before Christ's ascension, secondly, he gave his disciples a commission. This is what we term the Great Commission. He gave his disciples a commission, verse 19 in the first part of verse 20. He says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, a lot of things have been written and taught and preached about the Great Commission over the years. It is essentially one command with three action steps that stem from that command, right? The one command, simply, is go. <laughs> go. Go means have a purpose. Don't wait for people to come to you. You go to them, right? The, 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 the command is go. And the three actions that accompany that going are... Number one, in our going, we are to make disciples. We're to help others to decide to become followers of Christ as well. So not only is there this uh, challenge to share Christ uh, as, as, he, as the angel and Christ gave to the women, but it's even, even deeper than that. It's a, it is a direct command. It is a direct commission by the Savior himself for those who are his followers to, to be strategically working to represent him so that others are going to want to become his followers too. In our going, we are to make disciples. Secondly, in our going, we are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not that there is anything magical or mystical about baptism, but baptism is simply the sign that one has chosen to follow Jesus. It is an outward physical action that represents what Jesus has done on the inside. Baptism is a step of obedience for the follower of Jesus, whereby they say, I belong to Christ, and I want the world to know it. I am doing this in obedience to the command and the commission of my Lord. So my friend, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've trusted him for forgiveness of sins and eternal life, and if you have not yet been baptized, and maybe if you are sensing that he is wanting you to take that step of obedience, let me encourage you, talk to me. Talk to your pastor if you don't live near here. Talk to a pastor if you don't live near here. We'll arrange a baptism time as soon as it's possible for us to be this close together so that we can actually uh, uh, do this thing. All right? So in your going, in your going, make disciples. In your going, baptize. Thirdly, in your going, teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That's the lifetime goal of all of us, that we would first of all learn 
being growing in our relationship with God ourselves, and then that we would help to teach others to obey the things that we ourselves have learned, even as we keep learning more. So Christ assured them of his power and authority. He gave them a commission. And then finally, your last blank. In the last moments before Christ's ascension, he promised his disciples his enduring presence. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Isn't that a great way to end? Matthew starts his book with sharing about uh, uh, how Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of God with us in annual. And then Jesus himself finishes the book by promising that he will always remain God with us. He's with you, my friend. He's never going to leave you alone. So these last words of Matthew's gospel, there is something that's going to meet each one of us in these six things, no matter where we are at. And so I wonder, do you need, maybe it's about belief, do you need to believe in Jesus today? Do you need him to, to tear down that last wall of unbelief and pride, to see that come tumbling down? Believe in Jesus Christ today. Put your trust in him. Or maybe if you've wandered, reaffirm that trust in him today. Secondly, do you need to begin sharing Jesus with others today, like the angel and Jesus uh, uh, urged the women to do. You know him personally, but maybe you're sensing that he wants you to be a little bit more vocal about him to other people. Trust him for the words to say and begin sharing him with someone. It's really that easy. It's not at all, well, it's hard, but it's easy, <laughs> right? Now, and also, thirdly, do you, do you need to remember that he is our ultimate source of joy? He is our ultimate source of peace. Do you need to rejoice in him again today? Our heart's home is only found in him, and only he can give us that lasting joy and that calm assurance. Find yourself centered in him today. And then as Christ told the disciples, do you need the reminder that Jesus is the supreme authority and that nothing ever takes him by surprise? When you assert and remember and are, and are continually reminded that Christ is the ultimate authority, see how that changes your outlook on life. As you remember Jesus is the ultimate authority, see how that changes the way that you look at news and current events. When you realize that Jesus is the ultimate authority, see how that changes the way you view this unsettled world. Because my friend, always remember God is in control. That, more than almost anything, is such an encouragement to me as I read this passage this week. Do you then, maybe, as Christ urged the disciples, do you need to respond to his commission on you today? The command to go, to help draw others to him. The commission to baptize, or maybe to be baptized in your case. To find somebody to mentor, to build into you, even as you continue to grow in your relationship with God yourself. Maybe you need to look to look uh, to someone to be a mentor for you. All about this commission, this teaching, this baptizing, this calling others to be followers and disciples of Christ. And do you need to maybe lastly consider and rejoice again in the great truth that we are never alone. He is with us he will always remain Emmanuel, God with us. His presence rests on us. His presence abides with us. He is in us if we have trusted in him. Christ is our life and he will never, never abandon, never stop working in you, never stop working in me. And that, my friends, is such incredible, wonderful news. And I'm so glad that Matthew finished with that great point. And I will as well. Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, how we thank you, how we just give you thanks and praise for who you are and for what you've done. Oh, Lord Jesus, what an end Matthew writes to his gospel. We know that these are your words to us and we thank you for them. Ultimately, they aren't Matthew's words, they're yours. Thank you for the assurance that you rose from the dead, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the assurance that you're alive today. We see it through all four of the Gospels. We see it through all the New Testament. We even see it in the Old Testament. You are the fulfillment of prophecy, and you are God. You are alive today. We believe you, Lord Jesus, and we believe in you. Thank you that you want us to confidently share about you, rejoicing in your resurrection, rejoicing in your power, rejoicing in your commission, rejoicing in your enduring presence. You are with us always. You are with us every single day, throughout all our days on this planet and forevermore. 
May Jesus Christ be praised and may your Holy Spirit be free to work in us until we see you face to face. Lord Jesus, we pray this all with thanks in your great name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Chalmers community, family and friends. Uh, please stay tuned this week, as I mentioned before, for information about how we'll be uh, providing maybe an opportunity for a little bit more interactivity on Sunday mornings in our online services for those who crave that. And eventually we'll be able to get uh, back together again in person. We look forward to that and we pray to that end. But we are thankful for the fact that even if we can't be together, Jesus continues to be with us. Coming out of this study on the resurrection of Christ, we're going to start thinking uh, over the next couple of Sundays about the repercussions of all that. Our, our purpose, our vision, our mission going forward. I mean, in light of the Great Commission, why do we exist as a church? Capital C and small c church. What is our role here in this world? How should we then live? We'll explore some of that together beginning next week for a little while. All right. Till then. I know I've gone on a long time today, but I hope you've been encouraged. May the Lord bless you and keep you, my friends. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you, friends. Have a great, wonderful rest of your weekend, and we'll see you soon.